Welcome everybody to our first um, in the ladies room of the new year. I'm Patty Vargas and I am your host today. This is uh, another session in our women lead online forums that are brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. And today we are in the ladies room and you know what that is. That's that place where Women talk about things that we might not say just anywhere, you know, <laughs> things that we can only say to ourselves and to each other mm -hmm. because, well, because we have shared experiences here. So we like to say this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to one another, and come away with some new ideas or validation. So in the ladies' room, we go there. So our session today is about an hour, and if you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. And if you have something you'd like to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and I will share it for you. Now our topic today is, my job is fill in the blank, boring, outdated, doesn't suit me, uh, they expect me to do the work of two, you know, all of those things that we that we have to say about our jobs. And I have a fabulous panel joining me here today. So first, let me tell you a little bit about each of them. First, we have Erica Werner, and Erica is the Chief Marketing Officer with mm -hmm. Red Door Interactive, a full-service marketing agency with resources all over the globe. And Erica is also the Chief Operating Officer for Clubfoot Cares, a U.S.-based nonprofit advocacy group created by moms who have children with Clubfoot. So Erica, wave your hands. Everybody knows who you are. Hello. Next, we have Linda Lotto. And Linda does a billion things, but she has more than 20 years of experience as a dynamic organizational change agent and she has coached and mentored leaders to achieve new pathways to success with a focus on finding that career that you love and a job that doesn't feel like a job. So Linda, wave your hand. Here I am, hello. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Elizabeth Caetano. And Elizabeth is the author of Down the Rabbit Hole and Back. I think that back part is important to the story. And Elizabeth empowers stressed out professionals to take back their lives and thrive. If you're stuck in the middle of a life change and you need some kind of adjustment, Elizabeth has a set of proven specific strategies to get you unstuck. So Elizabeth, wave your hand, say hello. Hi. So that's our fabulous panel today and our guests that are joining us. You'll be able to see them as well. So let's just kick it off, you guys. Um, who would like to start? Why is this topic interesting to you? Or did you just join the panel because I twisted your arm and said, you <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> well, job satisfaction is super important uh, for the well-being in our lives just in general because we spend so much of our lives at our jobs. So yeah. it is a really interesting topic and something that I'm very interested in personally as well as professionally. So that's why I'm here on the panel. And you did twist my arm a little bit, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, similar I'd agree to with that. that. <laughs> I agree with that too. And, and similar to Elizabeth, it's a passion of mine. I've certainly spent my time at jobs that I loved at first and a few years would go by and then I realized I've outgrown this job. I am so done and it's starting to take a toll on me, you know, with stress and with health because it wasn't really what I needed to be doing. Um, so it's an it's an important topic and we do spend a lot of our time at work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think sometimes that first of the year, when I was still working in corporate, I don't know how many times my New Year's resolutions included getting out of here, you know, <laughs> or finding another job or something else. <laughs> how about you, Erica? Um, I'm in an interesting, I think, probably position in that I'm about to celebrate 16 years with Red Door in two weeks of 
the 18 years that we've been in business. And I think that's really unusual in this day and age that someone is with a company for that long. So I have certainly my, my perspective on why that's worked for me and, and why we, I can share some things about why we have a really high retention rate of our team as well. Um, but then also I have a lot of opinions about that you really have to know what you want mm -hmm. in your career and ask for it or create your own development path and not wait for like a manager to define that for you as well. And I think that that's where I see a lot of people that are um, younger in their career kind of waiting for this roadmap and um, they don't actively participate in the development of that, which can also create um, a disconnect as well. So yeah, those are the things that are on my mind. Yeah, very true. You know, I used to um, tell my, my team members, um, I'm not responsible for your career. You're responsible for your career. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll help you any way I can. You know, I'll send you to training. I'll open my Rolodex. I'll um, give you guidance and advice. You know, whatever you need, I'm, I'm here to help. But I'm, it's your career. It's your mm -hmm. life. You know, and, and I think you're right, Eric, a lot of times people don't know what they want and they're expecting um, their boss or the company or something to make a place for them and make a path for them. Yep, exactly. We have, um, we do monthly one-to-one -one meetings with our managers and direct reports. And um, one of the things that, I think is interesting that's and we're it's a very specific agenda that we're all committed to in the organization to um, follow consistently so that everyone's getting kind of that same opportunity within the organization to work with their manager but there's a couple of pieces in there that I think that are interesting um, one is that when we do our goal planning um, we have the goals that need to ladder up for the organization to meet our strategic plan but then we always have a professional development goal as well. And that can be um, education on like a, from a career perspective or something that's a passion that may be not inside of what we offer as a service at Red Door, mm -hmm. um, but something that is of interest that the person wants to explore to kind of itch that interest for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have another question. So we always create goals around learning as well. Um, and then in addition to that, we have a question that is always very kind of uncovers opportunity, which is if you had all the time in the world outside of your day to day um, roles and responsibilities within the organization, what other types of things would you like to be doing? Mm -hmm. And that has uncovered a lot of opportunity where we've actually had people move across teams because they didn't realize they were afraid to say to their manager, like, Hey, I'm working over here in strategy, but I really am interested in cross channel marketing and understanding like, wow, that we, we can move within an organization or at least start to explore other areas of the organization while we're in our current role and making the, the space for that yeah. to happen for them. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You bring up a good point about fear. And I think that a lot of times that's what holds people back, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I have a saying that I use when I'm working with clients of, you know, it's a no, if you don't ask, you've pretty much already said no to yourself. Mm -hmm. So ask, you know, if you're, I just was working with a woman who um, basically got a no on something she was very passionate about. She wanted to create a podcast at the place that she was working and it came back as a no. And when you get a no, it's also how do I handle the no? Right. And how do I either work around the no or how do I come up with something new as opposed to, oh, well, okay, now I'm just bored and I'm going to just quit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the handling disappointment, handling fear, handling um, whatever, the, the, the grumpy person that you work with. It, it really comes down to, okay, what am I going to do differently? Because I'm the only person I can control. Right. So I look at it more from this, you know, psychological and how can I empower myself mm -hmm. um, it, it, when, it, when it comes to fear or when it comes to the ask or when it comes to advocating for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's true. nice when organizations embrace the idea that, 
every single person has something very unique to bring to the table mm -hmm. and that it's important to leverage those unique skill sets and really employ them throughout the organization. Uh, similar to what Erica said, you know, taking a lot of those skill sets and moving them around because people grow and change yes. and they may have mastered <laughs> a job, but then they, they reach a point where they need to continue to grow professionally and personally. And so if they're able to have that dialogue with the manager or with the organizational culture that says, hey, we recognize that, let's move you to another kind of role. Maybe instead of doing sales, then you move into marketing or you move into accounting because you've always loved numbers. Mm -hmm. you know, those types of things are very important conversations to have within a corporate culture. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when, when you think about the fact that they say, you know, the average person now is, is going to have five or six different careers, you know, not just jobs, not companies, but careers. Um, because it, it seems like so many, so many doors are open to us now, maybe that weren't open to us before, or we think about um, our work differently. We're looking for satisfaction more than just having a job. I don't know what the reason is, you know, or all the reasons behind that, but how wonderful would it be if you could do that within the same company? You know, talk mm -hmm. about the, the retention that that company would have and the cost savings, you know, because attrition is so expensive. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. That would be really, a, a, that would be a fabulous thing. Erica, and why I, do you I, think that works at Red Door? <clears throat> um, well, part of it, I think, is that we do socialize it, that it is accepted to do that. And we have a lot of stories that we share, even like from the first blush of people onboarding to Red Door. Um, Kate DeYoung, who, um, she just retired. She and I worked together for 18 years, but she was part of the acquisition um, that I was a part of, of Red Door, um, that Red Door acquired our company 16 years ago. And when I met her, she was a programmer, like a, a very advanced software engineering programmer. I know Kate um, from way back. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. cool. Back in my project management days. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, great. so then she made the transition into project management, which is a completely different mindset. She started our, our PMP practice within Red Door and ran that group for many years. And then she's always had a really great skill set at training. So then she moved on to the HR team and was the head of our corporate development and training program. So really three careers mm -hmm. inside of red, completely different skill sets. Um, and so I think it has to start at the top though, where leadership understands um, that that is an opportunity and um, that they're open to exploring those things and making it that, you know, we have a culture of open-mindedness and respect at Red Door and that people can, we've had people sh and even shared stories of like, Hey, um, if you feel like you're not working well in your job or you're not excited about your job and you're even excited about something outside of Red Door, we've had people give us like a year notice on wow. things because they want to do a career change and we've helped them find their next job. So mm -hmm. I think it's having that culture of like people first and really, um, respecting that and that is it's not just about our own self-serving needs it's about their needs as a human as well mm -hmm. and truly caring about those individuals on that individual level is why it's worked so well and, and it's really socializing those stories so they can and see them seeing tangible evidence we I mean every year we have someone who kind of makes we had someone just shift from client services over to our search engine optimization team and we ask those people to socialize those stories so that people have the confidence to come forward when may, they may not feel like something's working for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I similarly worked for an organization that uh, in one department that was known to be a training ground. And so basically they expected people to come in there um, and these are all professional uh, financial type positions. They were expected to come in and they they were the, the breeding ground of really great people who were hand picked for other roles within the larger organization. And at first when I got there, I thought that seems kind of like a really expensive uh, you know, methodology there. But after I was there, I realized how, how loyal people became to the larger organization because 
they were basically trained really well yeah. and they knew that they were the cream of the crop, the best of the best, and they were the first ones to be picked to head up very challenging projects or heading other departments or things like that. So mm -hmm. it, it really created some great talent. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. I think that that, that, that is, um, at least from the vantage point of where I work is people are coming in to see me because my job is boring, my job is toxic, my jobs, uh, my uh, supervisor doesn't support me, um, I'm, you know, not, not on track to get the promotion, or the thing I've been working on, like this one client, uh, it, it, it just, she didn't get to, to do something she was very passionate about, and it was a budget decision, and I find a lot of people come in to see me because their work environment is the opposite of what you two have just described, which mm -hmm. sounds fabulous. I mean, I would, you know, if, if there were more companies like that, that would be great, but uh, unfortunately, I, at least from my vantage point, the, the, the people that are coming in to see me are working in more toxic, unsupportive environments. Yeah. And then that leads to, oh, my job is boring. My job is toxic. My boss is toxic. I don't, I, I feel tired all the time or I'm doing the job of two people. Mm -hmm. And then it comes down to, well, is this really, maybe you like the job, but the, the place isn't the right fit for you. And yeah. it is time to look for another job. Or yeah. maybe it is, um, that there is an ask that you can do as I was talking about earlier about you know can I switch departments can I work for a different supervisor find a mentor within the company if you like the company and see if that person will take you under your wing mm -hmm. so that at least is is where the people that I'm working with are coming from mm -hmm. um, and I think it's awesome that, that the two of you found companies that are <clears throat> like that but at least from where I'm coming from, I see those as few and far between. Is that anybody else's experience? Oh, absolutely, Elizabeth. Yeah. Elizabeth I will okay. tell you, <laughs> that was a rare and unusual situation. And since then, uh, the people who come to me are the same. Uh, they have toxic work environments. In fact, I've gone in to fix a toxic work environment. Um, and it, unfortunately, sometimes what I have found is, is uh, whether it's a man or a woman in a position, sometimes a toxic work environment gets, gets them so burnt out mm -hmm. that they no longer even like the work anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, you kind of wonder which came first, did they outgrow the work or did the environment become so poisonous and so toxic that literally everything in there, they just want to get away from. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is necessary is to just, you know, if you can't fight city hall, then it's time to go find a new building mm -hmm. to work in, a new, a new hall to work in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have had people that have come in on employee assistance programs where they're having specifically stress at the job and, um, you know, in, in a sense are almost being harassed. And then the, the question is, oh, well, but I'm not vested yet and I have to stay and get vested. And so there's all these different reasons why people stay, but at what cost to your physical and mental health? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of decisions that go into, for instance, am I going to stay or am I going to leave? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to transition into something else? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we created in Red Door, which we actually got an idea from another very large corporate organization um, that a group had started, um, we're, we call them our hacky hours, and the intention of them is to come up with a business problem <clears throat> that we need to solve for, and anyone in the organization is welcome, and we break into groups, and then we kind of do a Shark Tank style where people present, and we vote on the best solution to the business problem. But we've had people in accounting come and they're looking at, you know, researching mobile solutions for, you know, telecommunication service providers and things mm -hmm. like this. So, but we got the idea because when I was a part of Vistage, we did a tour of a very, another large organization and it actually born out of that frustration that they weren't able to learn from their direct department manager. Someone just kind of started more, it was like a lunch hour thing, like, hey, at lunchtime, we're going to meet and brainstorm on these types of things. And then like a groundswell started from there and it sort of elevated other opportunity in the organization. Yeah. There's certainly going to be the organizations where again, you've got to, you've got to do your due diligence when you're starting in your career or anytime you're switching jobs to really 
look at, you know, um, glass door ratings and talk about the culture of the company and really get a good sense of what that is because that toxicity <clears throat> tends to come from the top and, and trickle down. And so um, there's going to be places where you're just going to have to stick through it for the person that is, you know, waiting for their stock to, you know, to vest and yeah. things like that. And they have to hang in there. I think that it just becomes more of like a, a mental, um, like you have to have like your own therapy with yourself to say like, Hey, this is what I'm going to, this is what I can control. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm going to show up. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm going to create success for myself until I get across mm -hmm. that one year mark, whatever, so I can get that payout. Mm -hmm. And and still, I think you still have the ability to emotionally take control of what's happening and not let the situation get you so riled up because you, you've recognized it. You recognize that you, you don't want to subscribe to it. This is not long term. And here are the boundaries I'm going to set mm -hmm. while I do have to be in this environment right. and otherwise let it really roll off of you. And that's where I think some of the like gratitude work that I do every day and like mentally planning for how I'm going to show up in my day mm -hmm. could help someone like that in that type of a situation. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Because know, there's no guarantee that the grass is greener on the other side. No, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point too. Yeah. And, and every, trust me, we have our all sorts of issues at Red Door. We're not sure. Perfect. Yeah, everybody yeah. does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when I left San Diego um, and came up to the Bay Area, I went to work for a, a huge company. And you know, San Diego doesn't have that many big, huge companies. Um, and it was, it was a really interesting experience for me because, um, they, they had a great reputation, um, in the, in the industry. Um, but, but what I discovered when I got in there was it was a whole bunch of companies all together. You know, it was like, like almost by division, this division, their culture was like this and this division, their culture was like that. And, and there was like little fiefdoms, you know, and you didn't cross over. And, you know, so if you wanted to get a job in a different area, maybe you would, but not if the head of that division didn't like the head of your division. It was a bizarro yeah. place. Mm -hmm. you know? And the, the group that I was in reorged regularly, like about every six or seven months, they reorg. Rather than deal with organizational problems, they would just reorg you know, around it. And so in one of those reorg, I actually came into the company on a reorg, which I didn't know till I got there. But um, after one of the reorgs, I ended up reporting to somebody that didn't understand what I did, didn't value what I did, you know, kind of stuck me doing this other thing because in, in his mind, we were all just plug and play people that he could do as he wished with. And, and suddenly I was doing something that was not, not only was it not my core competency, I didn't even care about it. I, I was not the least bit interested in it, you know? So I started shopping myself around inside the organization and found it was, it was hard to move in the, in their kind of mentality, you know, about this division doesn't play with that division. And, you know, so I ended up leaving the company altogether. I got recruited away to a, a small company and that was kind of a better fit for me. And, um, until until they went belly up, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what? How do you like Linda in in your in your business? Like what what do you tell somebody that say they just come to you and they say, "I hate my job." What what do you begin to do with them? Like how do you drill down into what is what's really the problem do they really hate the job do they you know yeah it, you know that's that's usually the starting point um usually there's a lot more complicated uh you know factors to it but really it's about drilling down because sometimes people say well i just want to make a change or they get swept up into a change like a reorg and then they get swept away or they think oh this will be good but it's not, it's not planful. It's not something where they're actually driving what's happening to them. And that is actually the root I find of a lot of discontent with people and a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like to do is I'd like to combine a couple of different assessments to kind of deep down get into what makes them tick, what makes them happy, what kind of work makes them happy. And this changes over time. 
Mm -hmm. um, once, once we kind of figure that out, then we st start tackling kind of three areas. One is money. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. Sometimes people are afraid to make a change because they can't yeah. um, or they think they can't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to address money. We have to address that fear or that real concern. And then also, you know, identity. Sometimes people have said, but I'm a CPA. I've been a CPA for 15 years. Who am mm -hmm. I if I'm not a CPA anymore? Yeah. Well, maybe you're a more <laughs> authentic version of who you are now versus who you started out to be. And so that actually can be a pretty tricky, tricky area. And then, of course, you know, what do I do next? And what I what do I do next is a really big one because you can say, well, you know, like in my case, I've always thought it would be fun to be a barista, but I do know, and I am trained to be a barista. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I love coffee. I love the smell of coffee. I like making coffee drinks, but I think I would last about two weeks enjoying <laughs> being a barista. And then More than I, I would. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I know I thought I wanted to go pour wine in a winery and <laughs> it lasted three months. <laughs> oh, see, there you go. I like to do that too. <laughs> so, so it isn't just about saying, well, you know, I've always dreamt I wanted to do X or Y or Z. That's a good starting point, but sometimes it's really important not just to go after just passion, pure passion, but to also look at where are your core competencies? What are you really good at? And what, what makes you feel alive when you're doing it? Mm -hmm. And dialing into that and also coming up then with a strategy after dealing with those three concerns, then that helps really put people back in the driver's seat of their life versus feeling like they're in a river just going along with wherever it takes them. Mm -hmm. I'd like to... This is actually really personal about what I'm about to say. Um, I hope you guys are comfortable with me going there. Um, I, th I think that, okay, let me say it this way. There was a time where I hated my job at Red Door. I absolutely hated it. I was approached by recruiters. I took interviews. I almost left the company. And I was going through, I had, it was a time where, um, when I look back at that time of my life, my father died suddenly. He died 18 days after his pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, we had to short sale our house because we were in a fraudulent loan. Um, my son was born with a club foot. Like all of these things happened at this very condensed time in our life. We lost our largest client at Red Door Cricket Wireless that was 40% of our business and we had to lay off a significant amount of our staff. All of this happened within like a six month window. And for whatever reason, I had the wherewithal to realize like going somewhere else, is that really going to change my unhappiness right now? And through like a very deep mental health journey and going to therapy, I realized that I had depression. And, and I had no, and I, it's not what depression like looks like, like yeah. to, in my mind, depression is like, like rocking in the corner. Right. Like I'm a very social person. Okay. I host people at my house all the time. Yeah. I laugh. I'm a, I joke like, like what my knowledge of depression was like, I had no idea that that's what was happening to me. And so <clears throat> when I got that in check, I realized I was the problem. Mm -hmm. And no matter where I went, I was going to be the problem. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like there's so there, like of those assessments, like the, those are really helpful. And then there's a yes. And to that from a mental health perspective of like, what are your triggers? How is your mental health? Like where, like, how do you see yourself and show up in the world? Because you could be on this journey forever if you don't look in the mirror and fix those aspects of you. And I had no idea how sad and depressed I was until I feel as good as I do now. I literally had a panic attack at Red Door, mm -hmm. wheeled away on a stretcher mm -hmm. four years ago, almost to the date, only realized I wasn't dying because I was thinking to myself, um, what underwear do I have on with these hot firefighters that are rolling me away and <laughs> probably gonna rip my clothes off. Love it. <laughs> and like, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I don't think it gets talked about enough. And I'm so mm -hmm. transparent about it because I feel like it's just like, um, taboo topic that people are afraid to admit as a weakness and like I could cry right now like just yeah. thinking about how it changed my life 
mm-hmm. to yeah. have that realization and how important that is. And I think that there just needs to be more tools and conversation around that topic. I'm so glad that you brought that up. I actually, I, I am an author, but I'm actually a licensed psychotherapist in private practice in San Diego. And I have been for t- over 20 years. And one of the things that the question was earlier, you know, how do you dig deeper? And one of the things I look at is what are the outside stressors? Yeah. And ultimately we are the common denominator in our own life. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, like I'm a type A overachiever, go, 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 do, do, do. And last year was the rabbit hole from hell for me. Mm-hmm. And so dovetailing on that, my father died, my husband was diagnosed with cancer, and my daughter was hospitalized for 30 days. And I had to take mental disability for six weeks. Mm-hmm. I could not work. Mm-hmm. There, there, I just couldn't. And so a lot of times... That piece, I think, is completely left out of the equation when it comes to the business and the employer because they're just looking at their bottom line. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that we all go through things, we all fall down rabbit holes, and there's only so many stressors that a human being can take. Mm -hmm. And as women, I'll I'll put it out there, we can handle pain better than men. And so we can handle stressors, Mm -hmm. a few more of them maybe at one time. But when you have two and three and four and five stressors hitting you like a tsunami, you can't even see straight. So I really Mm -hmm. appreciate your bravery in in sharing that because Mm -hmm. a lot of times that's what I find is underlying is that there's a lot going on at home and there's no way we can be automons and just turn it off and then go in and, you know, right. do our job and then go home. There's, it, it just doesn't, we're not robots. Yeah. So right. I agree with you that the, the topic is much broader and needs to be discussed and, and brought out and paid attention to. Mm-hmm. So. I completely agree. In fact, most of the people who come to me, um, there's usually some kind of a life event uh, that, or usually more than one, as is often the case, um, because you're right, women tend to handle stressors um, really well. We juggle it all. And at some point, there's a breaking point, and there's always an epiphany. Somebody loses a child, or they go through a divorce, or they uh, lost their parent to cancer, or what, or they survived cancer themselves. Um, Whatever it is, after they get through the emergent part of that crisis, there's often a time of saying, okay, what am I doing with my life? Mm -hmm. What am I doing with my career? Why am I even here? What am I doing with my time? Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about assessments, they're not just simple, you know, oh, let's just take a test and see what happens. It's about really, I mean, that's actually where most of the work goes in. It's about really diving deep. Mm-hmm. and figuring out what is really going on what you know let's parse all of this out so we can figure out where you're really at because that's a really important aspect and I really appreciate your vulnerability in sharing that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah thank you you know I I um it's those life change things you know that um that cause you to to stop and really look at what am I doing? And, and to your point, Erica, what am I so upset about? Or what am I so sad about? You know, you could have made a horrible change um, and, and not solved the problem, you know, at all. And um, it, it was, it was funny. I was, um, I was working for myself and I was trying to get, you know, this, this particular part of my business off the ground I had a coach and I was doing all this stuff, but it was very, um, uh, how do I say this? It was like, you got to go, go, go. You got to post, post, post. You got to be at this place. You got to do this and you got to have a video all the time. And you've got to, and it was all a whole lot of a formula that was not me, you know? And, and I was uneasy about it, but I kept, I did it because it's what everybody else was doing. And it's what everybody else was saying was the way you're successful. And, and this is the way you get yourself out there. And, but it was so not me. And, and I was uncomfortable about it. Couldn't quite put my finger on it, you know, and just, um, you know, I've got to make this thing go. I got to make this work. I got to make some money. And then uh, when my son died, it was, you know, wow this is, it, it sounds trite, uh, or, or it, not trite, but it, it sounds 
like those two things don't go together, but it was like almost immediately I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I can't do this anymore. And it was a, a visceral reaction. You know, I can't do this anymore. And those things do make you just say, what happened to me? Where did I lose me? What, how did mm -hmm. I, you know, how did I get swept up into this thing, you know, that, that is so not what I'm supposed to be doing, not what I'm called to be doing. And yeah. you know, so. And that's actually why I wrote the book down the rabbit hole and back. Um, it's actually stop believing the lies and start living your own truth. It really is about a lot of times we do get lost as women and we wear so many hats and we have so many roles that, that it is what, but wait, what about who am I at my core, mm -hmm. at my, at my being? And a lot of times, I mean, I don't necessarily feel that growth can come without pain because how do we know the positive if we don't know the negative? Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, that's the truth. You know, they say that, that people who haven't gone through anything, you know, it, whether it's something devastating or it's just challenges and so forth, they don't really have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it's like to come out the other side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we don't learn from successes. We learn from failures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Monique, how about you? You're, you're so quiet. I am listening. Um, uh, most of the first part of the conversations, it's hard. I, I can't participate because I'm not in a corporate situation. I have my own company, so I'm self-employed. So different challenges that I have. Um, but the second part of this talk has changed where I can relate more. I was in the, hospital, in the ER two weeks ago mm -hmm. because my body collapsed. And um, because I was my body just couldn't keep up doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, um, recuperating and healing, um, physical therapy and um, having to just adjust my hours and my work schedule and not doing, not doing it all. Mm -hmm. So today I actually worked, just to give you an example, I worked eight hours today for the first time and I feel like I didn't do anything, like it wasn't enough because it felt like I was lazy. So coming from working 22 hour days, um, and, but your body just tells you, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. So I'm right now, that's where I'm at. So I was just nicely listening to all of you girls talk. And I think too, as women, we're taught to do, 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 go, go, go. And one of the things that stopped me dead in my tracks last year was this concept of just be. So sometimes it is about just stopping and breathing and being still and not doing. And then what I also find is that the doing numbs or helps us escape from what we want to avoid, which is pain, which is human nature. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have my vodka or at five o'clock somewhere is one way that we chase white rabbits down that hole, or I'm going to, you know, eat junk food and, I'm going to cope that way, or I'm going to do retail therapy, or we chase lots of rabbits in order to avoid pain. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, at some point, like what happened to you is my body just collapses because I can't do it. But that's what society values. That's what culture values. That's what corporate America values. It, again, that bottom line, how do we get blood out of a turnip? People that are doing the job of two and three people because of layoffs. And it's not humanly possible. Right. So having those boundaries going, I forget who said it, but going back to those boundaries is it's huge. It's huge learning how to say no. Mm -hmm. And then also examining how do I medicate? And, and this is personal story. I do, do, do. So I don't have to feel the pain. And then I collapse. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> well, I, I can relate to that as well. Like five years ago, I was really intently helping other people, uh, giving them advice on how to move into their uh, passion and, and get over the fears of making those changes. And then I took a, a three week uh, trip and I had time to, I didn't realize it, but I guess I was reflecting on my own life and I came back and I felt like my life no longer fits anymore. 
And that sounds like, oh, no big deal. But literally, I was looking at every area of my life and just wanting to opt out. Mm -hmm. Opt out of everything. <laughs> it was not working. Not adulting. <laughs> and so I, you know, it was like a breakdown. And it was, it was very unpleasant. And it was very much a shock to me, I think. And I'm not a person who's very surprised by very many things. So that was a tough one to endure. But I'm sitting here in California now. At the time, I lived in Portland, Oregon. And uh, it was two and a half years after that that uh, we moved to California, changed our entire lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that one experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I changed what I do for a living and everything. A lot of times the breakdown leads to the breakthrough. Yes. So. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. <laughs> well, you know, the, the universe gets our attention one way or another. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and it's, I don't know what it is about, um, you know, we say that men think they're, they're so strong and they have to be strong all the time. I think women have this problem of not, you know, saying, nope, can't take another thing, yep. you know, and yep. I can't take that project on. No, nope, no, I'm sorry. I've got too much on my plate because we, we pride ourselves on, just one more thing, go ahead, pile it on. I can do it. Look at me. You know, I can, I, I remember one time in a job interview actually bragging and, and I used this phrase, Linda, you'll love this. I said, I have a huge capacity for production. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. Doesn't it? It's you're an idiot, you know, <laughs> I have a huge capacity for production. And I'm bragging about that. You know, mm -hmm. So what's he thinking? You know, oh, great. She, she'll do the job of three or four or five people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a double-edged sword. Don't we as women think that, I mean, in the back of our minds, and maybe it's just me, but in the back of our minds, we're thinking, you know, I have to make sure that I look as good or better than my male counterpart mm -hmm. in order to be recognized, in order to be valued, in order to have credibility. Work twice as hard. Yeah. Twice as the hard. Money. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because we want, we're trying to reach that same level of credibility and uh, value in an organization or in a, any kind of, you know, in, with our customers or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, that's where some of the root of not being able to say no comes from. Yeah. We feel like we're risking too much. We've put in too much time or we've put in too much sacrifice and we're risking that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it will find you out. <laughs> it mm -hmm. does come back to bite you for <laughs> sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Erica, you're muted. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, there we go. I don't know how I got muted. I didn't press myself on mute, but okay. Um, <laughs> I think that also comes back to having where you can have control is having a really clear goal plan and that goal plan being prioritized so that when someone does ask for something else to come onto your plate, you can say, okay, I've got these things that need to be achieved. Like, where does this fit in? Where is something else going to give? Because I don't think sometimes people think in those, that context, it's just easy to keep dumping tasks and, projects onto someone's plate, but if you have a really clear strategic plan and everyone knows their goals, then it, it's very easy to say, okay, well then that can deprioritize and something can come off and be um, confident to have that conversation rather than just continue to pile on, pile on, pile on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do a million things subpar versus three things great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to manage that. You know, you, yeah. we're the only ones who can manage that. And, um, and it doesn't matter if you're working in corporate, it, it you know, as, um, as somebody who runs their own business, it's like, you know, yeah, I, I can work 12, I get to choose what 12 hours of the day I work, you know, it's like, but if I don't work, I don't get paid is right. my dilemma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it yeah. was scary as hell to take six weeks off last year. <laughs> Mm -hmm. longest time I think I've ever taken off in my entire career yeah. is mm -hmm. six weeks. Yep. So yeah, the, the same pressure, whether you're an entrepreneur or you are in a corporate is 
it's either self pile because it's just me mm -hmm. or you you're managing other people piling as well as your own personal expectation of self mm -hmm. and either way you still need boundaries they're they're imperative yep, yep. so mm -hmm. i remember um right before I was, I was going to get my MBA and I was touring schools. Um, and then I got pregnant with my daughter. So that went by the wayside, but just even the process of going through and thinking about what that would look like for my life. I remember one of the counselors said, um, as a part of UC Irvine said, going through this program, you will be judged not only on what you accomplish, but what you do decide to let go of. We are going to give you more work than you can human process. Mm -hmm. Part of part of your growth here is going to be what you strategically let go of. And if we can start talking in that context in that yeah. way, that people understand that that it's healthy to to say no. Mm -hmm. You have to say no. Mm -hmm. You saying no drives more profit because you can get distracted by a lot of different things and ideas. So um, I think that, that that can be part of the conversation as well to help not have guilt. Like you should be empowered to be like, I'm saying no, like this is the best thing I'm doing for the business is to say no. Mm -hmm. No is not a bad, is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That's brilliant that they, that they made that a part of the, basically the culture of that program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's huge. Mm -hmm. I did read a book that um, I don't remember the title. I'm, I'm kind of searching my brain, but I won't, I won't be able to pull it out. But it was about a gentleman who was overwhelmed at work and he just felt completely burnt out. And he was ready just to just, you know, leave it all. And then uh, he had been working with a coach and he decided to start saying no. And he realized that by doing that, at first it felt kind of different and he felt guilty, but after a while, he realized he was far more productive because he was only choosing the right things to say yes to. Mm -hmm. And everything else that was wasting his time, essentially, or that was really not that important, he was just taking off of his plate. And so he became more um, effective in what he was focusing his time on. Mm -hmm. And I and that part of the book really <laughs> stuck with me because it is so true. And I, I read it quite a while ago, but mm -hmm. it's just so true in that we have to be choosy about what we spend our time focusing on, our mental energy. And that's something I'm currently becoming aware of, not just about work items, but even social media or whatever it might be. We have to, we have to kind of streamline how much information is coming at us. Otherwise it always feels like we're under fire and under stress. And so that's something that I'm starting to, you know, I actually at the beginning of last year, I cut off a lot of my social media feeds. I just completely disengaged from a lot of that stuff and I have not been happier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. And so, again, those come back to boundaries. Yeah. Personal and professional. Right. Mm -hmm. Learning how to say no and then saying that no makes room for yes. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, um, Kind of a common theme in all of, of the discussion here is that, um, okay, my job is blah, you know, it's, it's fill in the blank, but really it's, it's not my job, it's, it's me. What is it that I need to understand about me? And is mm -hmm. there a disconnect between me and this work? Is there a disconnect between um, me and this company? Is there a disconnect between you know, what I, what I dreamed of being as a child and what I've ended up doing, you know, it's, it, it, if I'm, if I'm reading the tea leaves here, right, it's kind of like, it, it all comes down to us needing to do mm -hmm. a deep dive with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's In all areas. In and all giving areas. ourselves permission to mm -hmm. do that deep dive is really, really the first step. And it's so important. And it's, it's one that gets missed so often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, when I was a kid, um, I was not encouraged to go to college. It was like, if I wanted to go to college, I was fine. They'd find a way to get me there. But if I didn't want to go, that was fine too. 
and I, I'm old enough that I was of the, the generation where there was no stigma if you didn't go to school, you know, and, and so I, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I had a billion things I wanted to be. So I just got married, you know, and, and <laughs> it was fine. So I was never very intentional about, about anything and, and fell into different things, you know, as, as I went on. And it really, it wasn't until, you know, I was probably in my early forties when I said, wait a minute, what, you know, what am I doing? I don't want just a job. I want to make a difference. I want to do something that makes a difference. You know, that if I wasn't doing it, something would, would, um, would happen, would fall apart, you know, or something. And, um, so those, those times of awakening happen, you know, they don't necessarily happen when you're 18 and trying to decide where you want to go to school. They might happen when you're 40 or they might happen when you're 25 and 35 and 45 and 55 and 65, you know? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes I'll talk to my clients about it, instead of thinking about it so much when it comes to, you know, job saying no, saying yes, where do I want to be? Mm -hmm. I, it's more of how do you want to feel in your job? You know, do you believe in the culture? Do you believe in the company? Do you believe in the mission? And, and there are psychological studies that show that when people believe in the company and the mission, they are like two or three times more productive than people that don't buy into it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it's all, how do I want to feel in my personal life? How do I want to feel as a mother? How do I want to feel um, working in my community or in my church? Or, and, and that can sometimes bypass the shoulds. The, mm -hmm. you know, the, the shame, the, the fear that it's, mm -hmm. but I want to feel fulfilled in my job. I want to feel fulfilled in my marriage. I want my husband to feel fulfilled mm -hmm. and then working backwards from there sometimes can help people sort of go in the back door and short circuit that, oh, the brain, the computer is telling, but this is what I should do. And I have to wait till I get vested and blah, blah, blah. Right, so right. A lot of times I'll go in from that place. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to feel exhausted. I don't want to, I don't want to feel like I fall into bed and get up and it's groundhog day and I do it again. So I can't work 22 hours, mm -hmm. you know, right. I can't even work 12 in a row anymore. I'm in my fifties, you know, it's just physically mm -hmm. impossible. You know? <laughs> it's like I celebrate new year's at 9am. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Hey, the ball dropped in New York. That's what yeah, I'm. Thank you. Hallelujah. I'm in bed at nine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also honoring my stage of life. Yeah. And that goes back to, yeah, that might not come and, that realization might not come till 40, 45, 55. I work with a lot of 50-ish, 60, actually. I, I think one of the oldest clients I worked with was 78. Mm -hmm. And then a, a woman that came to my book signing was 91. And wow. she emailed me and she said, oh, I read your book and I learned so much. And it's so great to know that I can learn still at this age. Yeah. And, and a lot of it had to do with boundaries for her with one of her kids. And she's 91 <laughs> years old. It was awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And even, even as an entrepreneur, you know, those shoulds can get yes. you, to, you know, like I said, being told, oh, you should do this. You should do yeah. that. And just feeling freaking driven all the time. And, yeah. and not that, that this person was, was standing there and saying all those things. It was internal, you know, it was, but just, these are all the things I ought to be doing. And if I were doing these things, I would be as successful as so-and-so, you know, who's probably not all that successful. Really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, doing driven. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like I don't like driven. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, that's sort of a uh I don't have any intentions of of retiring. I can't imagine anything more boring than than retiring. And and people who do retire and and they're off traveling and seeing the world, it's like God love them. I think that's amazing. That's if that's what they want to do, that's wonderful. But I I need a, a I need work to do, you know, whatever that looks like. And um, over the the holiday break, I took a lot of time off because it's it's just it's a difficult time for me, and I have not allowed myself to do that before, and then find myself just sad and broken down and and you know just exhausted and worn out. And so I was very intentional this year about you know taking that time and doing what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. That's a good that's a good decision. 
And you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's about honoring that in ourselves. What do we really need? And I, you know, going back to the topic about, you know, not wanting to retire, I think our work should be extensions of what we love doing. I mean, ultimately, that is what I like to do about work. And I don't plan to retire either. It's, um, you know, I love being busy. I love having a mental challenge. I like uh, inter- engaging with people. I can't imagine retiring either. But that's just my choice, too. I like to do what I want to do. And that happens to be doing some work. Mm-hmm. I think the interesting thing too, to what you were saying, Patty, just about taking the time off. I, I also took off a lot of time over Christmas where normally I'm taking time off, but I'm still in email responding. And then it's like, what message am I sending to my team if I'm supposed to be on vacation, but I'm responding. And so it's interesting. I, I haven't worked on Fridays for, since I joined Red Door. I negotiated that as a part of um, my hiring at the time. And um, since then, it's kind of set a standard within the organization about having flex work schedules. It started because of a need of having my child. And then I was like, I can still get what I need to get done within a four day week and be really effective. I think one of the things that Like, so there's the one thing about being like demonstrating the behavior that you want to your team by not, you know, letting people have their personal time, but also you train the behavior of your clients. If you, if they send you an email and you respond right away, they're going to expect for you to respond right away. And so, um, there's, your inbox is never going to be clear. There's never going to be tasks that like never, you could work. 24 hours a day and it will never be enough. And so, you know, I, I started to learn that I could train myself out of what I used to do when I was in my twenties and thirties, I was like defined by my work. I was proud of like, I was so on top of getting packed with people and I was creating really destructive habits for my own mental and physical health. And so, you know, a client doesn't expect that you have to have all the answers in five minutes. They just want to be heard. So I started doing things like, hey, I got your message. I'll get back to you Friday. And and setting some expectations and giving yourself some breathing room so that you don't have to feel like you have, you're setting yourself at this standard to be so responsive that it's not even attainable. And especially as more and more things pile on. So that's something that I wish that my younger self knew I would have saved myself a lot of heartache um, and, and would have gotten a lot more sleep if I would have behaved that way. Yeah, that's the truth. That that's a whole other in the ladies room, totally. <laughs> my younger self, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that so is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you guys were just about to the end of our time. Um, anybody have any last parting messages that you want to put out there to the ethernet as far as uh, job satisfaction, self-satisfaction, job life self-satisfaction? <laughs> my, my, mine is just work on what's authentic to you and let go of the shoulds, let go of the control, let go of what doesn't serve you anymore and and really dial into how do i want to feel in my life mm-hmm. and and what's important to me and and a starting place can going back can be going back to just those like core values what's important mm-hmm. to you in your life mm-hmm. and we all have the same 24 hours the question is what are we going to do with those 24 hours yeah so mm-hmm. yeah that's great. i would say that for me it's uh it's super important to love what you do whatever that is and, and love it authentically um, and make, make your work an extension of, of your life. Instead of having work-life balance, have it be all inclusive, have it be something that you love doing. Life's too short mm-hmm. and, it, and it should mean something to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say in addition to the things that I already shared that I think are important, um, I might have shared this at another CWI event, but um, we do employee engagement surveys weekly at Red Door, um, Mm -hmm. whereas a lot of people do them annually, maybe biannually. 
Mm-hmm. And that is something that has been a game changer for us as managers, just to have a pulse on the organization. And the topics are wellness and job satisfaction and my relationship with my manager and my alignment with the vision of the organization. And we use a tool called Office 5. Um, it, it sounds overwhelming to do weekly engagement surveys. It's not at all. It's very plug and play. And I would encourage someone who maybe is in a larger organization, if they're not doing engagement surveys, to go to their HR team and suggest tools and resources. And I can tell you it's been a game changer for us to um, recognize patterns within the organization, um, look at ourselves as a leadership team and where we need to be more communicative in our vision so people can be in alignment with us. Um, see where health and wellness issues are happening within specific teams of the organization. The data and intelligence that's come um, from that practice has been a game changer for our organization um, and retaining our staff. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. That is huge. Great. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining me here in the ladies' room. Um, it always Uh, I'm always amazed at the conversations where I think they're going to go and then where they end up going. And I think that's what is unique about women and the way that we communicate with, with one another. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just another one that's been just been super great. And I got all kinds of ideas for, Oh, we need to have one about this. We need to have one about that. So (laughs) So stay tuned everybody. And for everyone that, um, that joined us um, here online and those that will be listening to it um, in the replay as well. Thanks for taking your time. And uh, again, Erica, Linda, and Elizabeth, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Monique, thank you for always being beautiful and and charming and having Mm -hmm. to say. So, um, and just stay tuned everybody. And I will see you next time in the lady. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care, everyone. You too.